tonight, what do Ontarians think about Quebec's move to impose a health tax on those who refuse to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I think it's a good idea. The COVID right here is spreading like wildfire. I'm interested to see how effective it is. We also speak to someone from Canada's Civil Liberties Association to get their take on the unprecedented move and... Every nurse matters. Uh, every person that we can get to that front line of care makes a difference. Help is on the way for Ontario hospitals, the province deploying internationally trained nurses to ease the strain on those facing the worst staffing shortages. Plus, it's very heartbreaking to have to tell people that we're at capacity when the weather is like this. As temperatures drop to dangerous levels, concerns for the city's most vulnerable, with many shelters and drop-in centers at or nearing capacity. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. It's an unprecedented move. Quebec announcing today it plans to impose a health tax on those who refuse to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's a move that has some here in Ontario questioning whether our province should do the same. And is it even legal? Kelda Jessica Ng reports. Those who refuse to receive their first dose in the coming weeks will have to pay a new health contribution. That's how the Quebec government is branding an upcoming COVID tax exclusively for the unvaccinated without a medical exemption. Premier François Legault says it's because the 10% of Quebecers who are unvaccinated fill nearly 50% of available COVID beds. They put a very important burden on our healthcare uh, network. The majority of the population is asking that there be a consequence. It's not clear if the tax would apply to 2021 filings. On veut que ça soit un montant significatif, donc euh, 50 dollars ou 100 dollars pour moi c'est pas significatif, mais on n'a pas encore fixé euh, le montant. Here in Ontario, residents have mixed feelings about our neighboring province's COVID policies. That includes a rule that kicks in January 18th, which will require Quebecers to present a vaccine passport to enter provincially owned liquor and cannabis stores. They have the authority to do that, I believe. You're kind of putting everyone else's health at risk if you're unvaccinated and you're going out. If you had to pay that personally, would you feel it's fair? A hundred? No, it's more a, than a hundred. More than a hundred? Uh, that's a little too, too, too much. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association saying it's more of a fine than a tax. I think punitive and intended to be um, a, a way to compel people to be vaccinated. And public health experts talk about the need to kind of build trust and meet people where they are. And um, this doesn't seem to, to jive with that. Zwiebel says the organization is waiting on more details, but won't hesitate to pursue legal action if it violates charter rights. Ontario NDP leader Andrea Horvath also disagreeing with the principle. If that's something that the, the premier of... Um of Quebec is prepared to, you know, to do, then that's uh, that's his obviously his prerogative. Some are more understanding. I'm interested to see how effective it is at increasing the percent of people who do go out and get their full vaccination. I think it's a good idea because uh, the COVID right here is spreading like wildfire. Especially after seeing the toll the pandemic is taking on frontline workers. So I come from a family of doctors. They were really sick and tired of. They are already exhausted. They are at a breaking point. Jessica Ng, CBC News, Toronto. The province is reporting more than 3,200 people in hospital with COVID-19 tonight. Just under half of those patients were admitted for reasons other than COVID. But the strain on the healthcare system is forcing some hospitals to take extraordinary measures to cope. The province also announcing today it will be bringing in internationally trained nurses to join the fight. Chris Glover has more on all of that and some positive developments that appear to be on the horizon. 80 patients with COVID illness were admitted to ICU yesterday alone, the most ever in Ontario on a single day. So we are seeing uh, a historic moment here and the hospital system is doing everything it can. It is fighting like hell. In Brampton at Peel Memorial, that fight means closing the urgent care center until at least February 1st. In Ottawa, at the city's largest hospital, it means COVID positive workers may soon stay on the job. It always felt as though, like, we'll never get there. You know? Dr. Susie Hota with Toronto's University Health Network says they're also developing a policy around COVID-positive staff using guidance from the Ministry of Health. 
weighing the risk of you know transmission by by doing so within the hospital with you know the ability to actually provide clinical services. Today alone, roughly 1,000 frontline staff are off sick at UHN facilities, and province-wide staffing shortages are converging with record hospitalizations to overwhelm resources. Expanding opportunities for internationally educated nurses is just one more way Ontario is bolstering its healthcare workforce. Today, the health minister joined the CEO of Ontario Health to announce internationally trained nurses will soon join Ontario's COVID fight at 51 hospitals in the roughest shape. Every nurse matters. Uh, every person that we can get to that front line of care makes a difference. Ontario Health says 1,200 have applied to the college. Roughly 300 could be matched with hospitals right away. It's really a win-win uh, for both the applicant and for the hospital. They should be all happy and smiling. But the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario is not happy and smiling. The CEO says this step should have happened ages ago. And yet today the minister stands there to make the announcement. 300 internationally educated nurses will come to save the hospitals. And while hospitals are in dire need of saving right now... One thing I would say that perhaps is some good news for us at this moment is that the rate of increase on hospitalizations uh, seems to be slowing. Ontario Health says the rate of hospitalization is slowing with the peak expected by the end of the month. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. As we first reported last night, students will be heading back to their classrooms next week. That news coming as a relief for many students, parents and teachers. But as Ali Chiasson reports, there are still concerns about safety and uncertainty over whether the return to class will last. A lot of the folks lined up for rapid tests had their kids in mind. I have kids that are going to be going back to school and I don't really know what's going to happen. It's kind of all unknown, so I want to make sure that I have ability to test and find out what what I need to find out within my own home. Back to school is going ahead as planned and Ontario school children will return to classrooms on Monday the 17th. I think it's really necessary. Going to school is the best thing for kids to be with their friends. For parents forced to drop everything and accommodate for the province's flip-flopping on the issue, having kids back in class is good news, but there's an undertone of uncertainty. But if they're going to put them all in a class, 30 in a class, I don't know how that's going to work. The elementary teachers union echoes that. We know it's it's it's, a, it's airborne. We know it's highly contagious. Uh, we heard from the premier there it's a tsunami. Uh, I don't think that tsunami just sort of just stopped uh, immediately a week, a week later. Today, Health Minister Christine Elliott addressed the media and discussed how they've made schools safer in the interim. Over uh, 9 million masks to staff and um, three ply masks for students as well. We've also ordered over 3,000 more HEPA filter units to make sure that we can uh, have the appropriate ventilation. And Infectious disease specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh says. I think it's safer, but of course nothing's perfectly safe in this era. And it would be better if rapid tests were more accessible. We don't know uh, what the status of rapid tests. Something the TDSB is waiting on as well. I know the Prime Minister, I believe it was last week, announced more than 140 uh, million rapid tests being distributed to the provinces. We're not sure exactly how many will be allotted to education or the TDSB specifically, but that's one of the pieces that we're looking forward to finding out uh, if that will be available uh, to students and staff in the near future. We should learn more tomorrow from Education Minister Stephen Lecce, who's scheduled a back-to-school announcement tomorrow afternoon. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Colette Kennedy joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Colette, another very cold one out there, but temperatures have been climbing. Thanks, Calda. You know, it really seems like we have had a winter season so far where we've had to adjust ourselves to the roller coasters, the ups and downs. And basically, it's been mild, but that has obviously not been the case the last couple of days, but especially this morning where we dipped down to minus 21 and it felt like minus 31. So definitely we're into that cold trough. But here we go, that roller coaster now. We've been coming down the slope. We're going back up. And that means overnight tonight, our 
temperatures continuing to rise and into tomorrow will be about five degrees above seasonal. And then even Thursday, still a little bit mild, but guess what? You ride a roller coaster up and down. Yeah, it keeps going in that manner. So cold air back by Friday. A look at the winds though. This is what will help to push those temperatures up. Breezy conditions overnight tonight and early tomorrow morning before those begin to subside. So minus three, that's as the temperature keeps climbing. And then tomorrow afternoon, three degrees. A lot of cloud cover though still. And uh, at times we could still see some flurry activity in there, Kelda. Thanks so much, Colette. The extreme cold today brought with it renewed attention to the city's shelter system and calls for more efforts to help the vulnerable. Natalie Collada has that story. Monday through Thursday, staff at All Saints get ready to provide meals, medical care, and a safe place for Toronto's unhoused to rest. But with the pandemic, like many programs, the daytime drop-in centre has had to limit capacity. At any given time, we have a couple of people waiting to be let in. It's very heartbreaking to have to tell people that we're at capacity when the weather is like this. Overnight, the city was under an extreme cold weather alert. Temperatures fell to minus 21. But the pandemic is making it even harder for people to find refuge. The latest data is that 44 shelters currently have outbreaks. So basically, even if by some miracle there is a bed, you're telling people that their choice is to be outside in minus 30 weather or to put themselves in communal setting where they're most likely going to contract COVID. I don't think that's humane. City data shows it's currently providing space for approximately 7,300 people in its shelters, with most running at or near capacity. I'm not going to sugarcoat this, Natalie. It is incredibly challenging, especially during an extreme cold weather alert. The City of Toronto has added shelter spaces, warming centres and rented rooms in 26 hotels this winter. Somebody shows up at a warming centre that's full, we're not going to turn them away. Uh, we, we, we have TTC buses that we can then transport them to another warming centre uh, so that they remain safe. That is our priority is people's health and safety as we continue to look at, at, at the longer term solutions uh, to, to homelessness. Including affordable and supportive housing. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Backlogs are forcing the Ministry of Transportation to temporarily halt some of the tasks drivers are asked to complete in order to pass a road test, like three point turns, roadside stops, and parallel parking. Here's how some people reacted to the news today. You know, you can avoid parallel parking if you hate it that much. My mom hasn't parallel parked in years. Like, it's not something you should have to be tested on again and again. Doing parallel parking, eh, you're probably going to do it in downtown Toronto once in a lifetime, right? Three-point turn, every student knows how to do it already. The province says the move will cut the full license test in half, creating more test spaces. The changes only apply to Class G road tests. The changes went into effect yesterday and will run until at least March 31st. A previously requested budget increase for the Toronto Police Service has been unanimously approved by the Services Board, but it still needs the OK from a city committee. Now, the budget was approved after a nearly four-hour meeting this morning. Toronto Police Chief James Raymer reminded members of the Police Board that the service has operated without a budget increase in three of the past five years. The budget will be increased by 2.3% if approved by the city. Now, that's roughly $25 million more. Welcome back. CBC News has obtained copies of polling that the Ford government commissioned on its COVID-19 response. The surveys were paid for with tax dollars and show public support for the government's handling of the pandemic decreasing with each new wave. Our Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley has this exclusive story. When COVID was killing hundreds in long-term care, when lockdowns shuttered businesses, or when schools were closed. At every stage of the pandemic, the provincial government has conducted weekly public opinion polls. The results were kept from the public until now. Polls from last spring show the government's approval rating sagged as the third wave built. This is not going to be unique to the Conservative government in Ontario. Canadians as a whole are frustrated with the pandemic. 
The polling is not all bad news for Doug Ford and his progressive conservatives. Some demographics are more likely to say the government is on the right track. People without kids in the school system, low-income earners, new Canadians and those living in the 905. There's a real push-pull for the government in terms of trying to satisfy a larger group of Ontarians who seem to really be in favour of interventionist measures. After the government announced its proof of vaccination plans for accessing indoor venues such as restaurants, three-quarters of those polled said they approved. Last summer, the pollsters asked whether COVID-19 vaccinations should be mandatory for kids to return to in-person classes. 70% of those polled said yes. Despite that, COVID vaccinations have not been mandated for Ontario schools. I asked the government how the polling factored into its pandemic decisions. In a statement, the Premier's spokesperson said all governments use polling to better understand public opinion on important issues. This is just another example of this being um, a government and Doug Ford being a premier who is obsessed about his political support rather than the importance of providing responsible and competent leadership to the people of Ontario. The more important thing to do is to listen to the science and make decisions based on the well-being of, of the public and the managing of a global pandemic. And I think one of the things that has uh, has been problematic is that they haven't done that consistently from day one. During the last fiscal year, the government spent nearly $700,000 on its COVID polling. Mike Crowley, CBC News, Toronto. You're looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline. More clouds will be moving in as we head into the overnight. And temperatures have been steadily increasing. Still chilly though, currently minus three in the city, but feeling more like minus 11. Let's go back to Colette now. And Colette, after a mild Christmas, things have taken a turn, haven't they, with this extreme cold? Well, Kelda, I guess many would say we've had it kind of easy when it comes to weather anyway so far this winter season. December, definitely mild month for us. And obviously everything turned around with that temperature this morning down there at minus 21, but more significant, those wind chills. Well, let's take a look at those weather headlines because things are moving in the opposite direction now. And we're going to actually be seeing those temperatures on the rise. It's already started. They were coming up through the evening hours and continues overnight tonight. But we do have windy conditions to accompany this. So those winds from the south southwest quite blustery uh, they'll ease up by tomorrow afternoon and uh, you know it can't last because it is january so we'll do okay into thursday but then we'll find the cold air comes back friday and especially friday night so that saturday morning will be another bitterly cool one okay overnight temperatures just look how normally we see that trend will they drop overnight no those will be coming up and there are your 9 a.m temperatures as they continue to click up through the day tomorrow so the wind gust this is a, a model maybe pushing them a bit extreme but still it is certainly possible to be seeing some of these gusts over 60 kilometers an hour and certainly we will be having gusts to 50 and above and then by tomorrow afternoon you see how they ease back up now, I wish I could say that there was going to be sunshine to go along with the mild temperatures. Unfortunately, we are still looking at some straight flurries uh, at times and also quite a bit of cloud cover. If you get into one little sunny break or sliver, uh, consider yourself very lucky tomorrow because we won't see much of it. Still a lot of cloud cover hangs in there on Thursday as well. So a couple of mostly overcast days with some very light precipitation. Your temperatures then, that's just as they're on the rise there for southwestern Ontario and a look at where you're headed winds are four degrees uh, not too bad for a January afternoon overnight in the GTA a look at those readings and getting above freezing which will be very nice after the minus 31 wind chill this morning so your temperatures into Thursday still mild and there you have it as we go towards Friday and into the weekend Oh, doesn't it always seem that way, Calda? Just in time that the cold air is uh, coming right back and knocking on our door once again. Just our luck. Thanks so much, Colette. A mobile health program has been helping to ensure Peel's most vulnerable population doesn't fall through the cracks. Now, thousands of people experience homelessness in the region every year, a number that has grown during the pandemic. As Talia Ricci explains, Homeless Health Peel started as a temporary program and now advocates are pushing to make it permanent. I was working in the tourist 
field. And because of this COVID, uh, I lost my job. For Bill Smith, the pandemic meant a loss of stability. It's been a challenging two years, but not having to navigate the healthcare system on his own helped. They've organized uh, medication for me, uh, been able to arrange uh, other kinds of stuff for me. So, you know, it made me feel uh, comfortable and reassured me about stuff. Homeless Health Peel was launched at the beginning of the pandemic. So far, it's worked with over 1,200 clients with a goal of making sure everyone can access health care. We'll pretty much go anywhere we need to. We operate out of a toolbox. We, I got a toolbox I got from Home Depot. So it's really incognito. We keep all our equipment there. So if we're going to an encampment, there's nothing that says, hey, there's homeless people here. You know, we look like we're just going to go fix something in the park or something like that. Clinton Barreto says it's been clear the program was needed and needs to continue. He says the benefits impact the entire health care system, ensuring people don't end up in the hospital for things that could be treated by a family doctor. They're going to get their service at the hospital and, you know, contribute to hallway health care, contribute to longer wait times. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not dignity. Uh, it's not dignity and care. It's substandard care. Yeah, everything's been good. Yeah. It has a little more we have free health care, but you couldn't imagine the barriers that some of these individuals have faced trying to navigate the system. It almost becomes a two-tiered uh, medical system for those experiencing homelessness. The region of Peel says this program is part of its COVID-19 emergency response. That funding is set to end in June. Homeless Health Peel has been advocating to make this program permanent. The region says it's working on a plan. So we're certainly doing our due diligence to understand what a permanent model would look like. And we're designing that together with a variety of stakeholders in Peel with a goal of coming to council with some recommendations uh, in March. Those who have benefited from the program say the need will outlast the pandemic. And it's not just me, it's all kinds of other people. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Brampton. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Dwight Drummond has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.